This is a review of the Vatir DG1 belt driven two speed turntable. Now, this turntable looks very interesting indeed. And I'm sure if you have seen the images for yourself, you will be, what's the word? Well, the word I can use for my impression was wowed. I was very intrigued indeed. The design looked edgy, looked different. It was a definite statement, something intriguing, something that was a little bit left field in terms of the norm that we see in the hi-fi industry. And I don't mean the angled effects on the plinth either. There's the flat groove rider arm and many other features, which we'll get to in the closer look section in a second. This particular turntable can be bought for £2,750, including the arm. Many dealers will add a £100 moving magnet cartridge to that from Audio-Technica. The VM520 is very nice indeed, but I wouldn't recommend using it with the DG1 because in my eyes it would be an immediate bottleneck and really not worthy of a turntable of this sort of capability or potential capability. We'll come to the actual facts a bit later on in the video. So if you are going to buy a DG1, I would say, hello, Mr. Dealer. Yes, I would love the DG1, but can you install something rather more superior? I would go for a moving coil of some sort, something around, I don't know, six, seven hundred, eight hundred pounds, give or take, just to give the turntable a fighting chance of performing to its capabilities. Now, before we get to the closer look section, I'd just like to hold my hand up and say, I messed up. Yes, me, Mr. Perfect, I messed up. And I'm happy to admit it because it alerted me to a bit of a strange feature. Now, when I took the DG1 out of the box, you have to then put the turntable on the side. Underneath is a little transport screw. What you have to do is unscrew the transport bolt with something like a coin to use as a pseudo screwdriver and you loosen the bolt and you take the entire housing out. It's like a metallic housing which this bolt is attached to. Now if you're not taking photographs or doing video like I was and you're careful this whole process will be a breeze and it'll be fine. I'll include a little video from a Viter employee who does this and it looks a breeze. Now I wasn't paying enough attention, obviously, because I was doing photographs and videoing at the same time. So there's a little tag you can hold on to stop the housing falling into the plinth. Well, I let go at one point, didn't I? And the whole thing fell into the plinth, where it still is right now as I'm talking to you. I'll get it out. It's not a problem. It'll come out eventually. But you might be concerned if that happens to you. Just be a little bit careful. Study the video. As I say, I'll put the link below. In terms of the tier itself, I'd like the company to change that. Because if I can mess it up, and my goodness, if it's messy up a bull, I will mess it up. No problem about that. Then if I can do it, it's possible other people may do that too. Now I've seen a range of transport lockable devices on a range of hi-fi equipment, including lots of other ten tables. And I think the Vatir transport lock, well, there's room for improvements, put it that way. One for Vatir to look at. Let's get straight to our little guided tour and the closer look section. And welcome to the closer look for the Vatir DG1. And before we get any further and look at those interesting moving bits, just take a look around the edges of the plinth and you can see the sandwich construction of this plinth. You can see the see-through transparent acrylic bit in the middle flanked by the sandwich of the two black layers on the upper and lower sections. This is a or the whole thing really is a non-resonant cast acrylic construction which forms that main plinth. There's also a sub plinth which we'll have a look at next that's underneath the platter there. Underneath that sub platter is a quite stiff silicon suspension as you can see it's not wobbly at all. What is a little bit wobblier is the pulley which is isolated and that moves around just as you can see by the touch that is isolated from the rest of the turntable. 
The whole assembly sits on a steel chassis, housing the motor drive circuit and the motor by three slender feet. And I chose this particular bubble level from Avid just to make sure everything was as it should be before I did the sound tests. If you do need to level the turntable, then the feet, well, you can see one of three here, can be adjusted. It's on a screw thread. Let me show you. And underneath that foot is a little felt pad. One of my felt pads did come away. It's easily stuck back on, but just be careful of that. A dust cover is supplied, by the way. In the center there, you can see the steel spindle. That's supported by an acetyl spindle thrust bearing using a tungsten carbide ball. The DG1's 24 pole precision synchronous motor is run by an external wall wart power supply. And in case that worries you, well, the entire motor power supply assemblies have been worked upon by the company to lower noise. Changing the speed is accomplished by pressing this little button. And you can see it sort of looks like a bit of an afterthought, I think. You press it once anyway, it goes green, that's 33 and a third. You press it again, it glows red, and the turntable speeds up to 45 RPM. And then if you press it and hold, the turntable turns off. I actually think this button is a little bit too close to the belt. It's very easy to touch the belt and transfer sweat onto the belt itself. Now, if we just look at this still image for a second, if you look carefully, well, you don't have to look carefully at all, but there really is no indicator on this plinth to say what speed the turntable is running at or what it has been changed from and to. Why is that, I wonder? In addition, why should green indicate 33 and a third and red indicate 45 RPM? In fact, the human psyche says that green is good and red is bad, which is doubly confusing. This area seems wholly random, something thought up after a few drinks in the pub. I have seen turntable speed selections without labeling before, but at least they utilize some form of logicality. For example, twist a knob for 33 and a third, and again in the same direction for 45 RPM. That is, the further you twist, the faster the platter speed. Then reverse the process to turn the platter speed off. That makes some sort of sense. The Vatia option here does not. Of course, once you see the turntable in action and you see the platter move, you can deduce what speed the platter is moving at. But look, I'd rather not use deductive reasoning to actually work out what speed my turntable is running at. I'd rather know before it happens. The DG1 three layer one piece groove runner tone arm uses a flat profile, as you can see, as opposed to the standard tube like construction with a flexible PCB sandwiched into the arm itself to carry the signal from the cartridge. And that cartridge I'm using here is an Audio Technica OC9. No tone arm cables are used in the arm itself, which is an intriguing design choice. The arm doesn't use conventional bearings, but self-damping twisted nylon threads, one for movement in the horizontal plane and two for the vertical axis. Used according to the company to remove something called stiction, which is initial resistance to movement. Again, very interesting indeed. The rear mounted weight for cartridge tracking force is attached by a screw bolt that hangs below the actual arm. Changing the weight's position includes loosening that upper bolt that you can see going in and out of focus there and sliding the weight assembly forwards or backwards to change the tracking force. Doing so is fine. The sliding action can be a little sticky. The weight hardly moves smoothly, but it's certainly doable. And let me attach that weight to the rear of the arm for you so you can see how it actually fits. As I say, it sort of hangs below the rear of the arm affixed with that screw thread bolt there. More refined alterations are handled by another sliding weight option across the top of the actual tone arm itself. This weight can be moved by loosening the Allen screw you can see in the center of the screen there on top of the arm 
Again, the movement was a little clunky, but the assembly gets the job done. Moving the DG1's weight requires you to grab and drag a bit, and it lacks a little bit of finesse, I have to say. Just be aware that the platter is quite thin and partially suspended in the air. If you push, as I'm doing here, towards the platter, it will give. So just be a little bit careful about what tracking force gauge you use. Don't use anything too heavy. A standard digital type gauge will be fine. On top of the arm is an anti-skate wheel, but as you can see here, there's no numbered gauge. So you have no idea what setting the anti-skate is currently running at and you've no idea how much anti-skate you're actually applying. The manual tries to help, but that doesn't get the job done either. I set my anti-skate by ear, others may have issues. I asked the company about the wheel and it said this to me, quote, there are generally two types of customer who will buy the DG1, the enthusiast and the music lover. The enthusiast will either set the anti-skate by ear, as I did, or will ask his retailer to do so. It comes out of the box set to work with most cartridges at a tracking force of 1.8 to 2.1 and it's certainly set correctly if a cartridge is fitted at Vatir. The music lover will almost certainly buy it with a cartridge fitted, end quote. I'm sure there are plenty of other users out there who will want to add their own cartridge which might very well be set at a quite different anti-skate setting. Quite apart from the latter, it would just be nice to be reassured that the wheel is at the correct setting. Being able to visually confirm that setting is everything I feel. As is, many users will feel completely in the dark. On the arm itself is a transport screw, and this is what I'm undoing here. And when you remove that, you can see that the arm moves freely too freely because there's no restraining clip. So you'll end up using the transport screw again just to keep the arm in place during operation. So for example, I'm just about to play a record here, undoing that transport screw which keeps the arm in place. And you can see how the arm just moves on its own, almost of its own accord. It's not actually secure. It doesn't never feels secure where it sits. So there you are, record is now playing, but the arm, feels a bit sort of, well, it doesn't feel secure when you put it back in its little housing. It really needs that transport screw to keep the arm in place, just to safeguard from any accidental knocks. I would have preferred to see a restraining clip of some sort. Using a transport screw is a little bit clunky in my opinion. The belt is of silicon construction, as you can see here, and it's bespoke in nature. The platter is aluminium, but also features a cork rubber layer underneath. The actual turntable spans 469 millimeters by 384 by 130 millimeters and weighs a healthy eight kilograms. The plinth is actually illuminated by a white light, adding what the company likes to call an ambient aura. And I wasn't really a fan of this. The reason I wasn't a fan really is, as you can see in the center of the screen, you have a light shining directly out of the front of the turntable. You can't really appreciate it with this simple image, but it can be a little glary if you're looking directly at it. I just wish the light was positioned in a different place. You can turn off the illumination if you wish, but you have to run through a series of button presses via that speed button to do that. And I would have preferred a simple button on off switch, something recessed maybe under the lip of the plinth perhaps. So that's the close-up of the DG1, a bit of a cure its egg really. There are many innovative and excellent features within the overall design and Vatir should be applauded for having the gumption to try something different in the first place. Some of those features work better than others it has to be said. Those I have criticised are not a major problem so don't get me too wrong on this but they don't help installation or general use especially if the user is less than experienced. But how does the Vatir DG1 actually sound? Well, let's go over to the sound tests and let's find out, shall we? And welcome back to the sound tests. And to begin the sound tests, 
I thought a little bit of folk might be in order, so I grabbed a 1973 album, the self-titled album from Griffin, a UK outfit, full of contrasting instrumentation, varied vocal presentations, a good test record, basically. The design of the DG1 might be quirky and a tad eccentric, but there's nothing quirky about the sound quality. In sound terms, the Vatea is quite magnificent, at least from this folkish outing. We'll get to higher energy rock a bit later on. What struck me here was both the tonal realism and tonal balance from this turntable, both fundamental in how music is presented to you. The realism from the DG1 was quite magnificent. For example, there is one acoustic guitar element on the track Sir Gavin Grimbold, which was strummed but then immediately halted, giving the sound a clipped effect. This strum can sound more like a buzz and nothing more from some other turntables I can name. They tend to average out the detail instead of conveying all the subtleties. The Vatier, on the other hand, tracked all of the detail, brief as it was, so that the ear heard the beginning of a full strum, cruelly cut off in its prime to a sudden halt. Then again and again. The buzzing noise from some turntables of a similar price point was translated by the DG1 into a suite of short, sharp strums full of information. Delicate sounds from the mandolin plus secondary percussion, such as bells, provided impressive accuracy, but also that tonal balance I mentioned earlier. You felt that all of the instrument was on show here, from its natural highs to the lower frequencies within its own presentation. That is, bells, for example, didn't just give the expected ting sound, but offered information lower down. This meant that the bell hits provided the ear with a more variable metallic sound. The amount of secondary information from that bell provided valuable extra detail on the instrument's size, for example. The Vatier certainly delivered on that point. The lower noise floor offered by this turntable meant that bass from the percussion had a lean, nimble, yet still powerful effect. Hence the music never dragged or smeared across the soundstage. Instead, the bass pushed the music onwards. There was a foundation provided. Also though, it had impetus. Hence the music sounded fleet of foot and ready to be off. The accuracy and focus from the upper mids and treble also meant that instruments like the recorder never wandered but had a precision that allowed space to appear in between notes, adding to the natural reverb which gave the overall presentation a richer tone. I then turned to a piece of rock and Queen's Somebody to Love from the album Adair the Races. And what I found here was bass, because bass was obviously an important part of this quite high energy rock piece, because bass was an important part of this particular song. I thought that bass didn't dominate, it wasn't the main part of the recipe. Bass integrated itself pretty well into the mix. So what bass did, it produced a sound which had, what can I say, finesse, I suppose. It wasn't humongous, it wasn't like a monster coming at you, it wasn't in your face. It had power, yes. It had an organic tonality, yes. But it had a bit of finesse and it integrated well into the song. It was part of the song. Not like with some turntables on some rock tracks, it can dominate, it can be the main squeeze. Not here, it integrated very nicely indeed. I was also impressed with the imagery on this track with the lead guitar placed to the rear of the lead vocal, the harmony vocals behind that and so on. The layers created on this track were easily recreated by the Vatier and delivered to the ear in a natural and easy manner without fuss or hardship. The overriding effect that I took away from this track on the Vatier was, and I know this might sound a bit odd, but it was the view. The view of the music. The DG1 provided a panoramic view of what was going on. 
taking in a broad sweep, the band were arranged right across the soundstage, and that gave the music an epic twist, adding to the grand effect of this rock classic. I've rarely heard a rock track float across my ears so smoothly before. The effect was quite endearing and wholly attractive, of the sort that would encourage early morning listening. I could easily be flipping vinyl until two in the morning or more with this deck, just to see, you know, you know what I mean. I wonder what this LP sounds like on this turntable, that sort of thing. So what do I think of the Vatia DG1? Well, the design of this turntable is bold and adventurous, and as I said earlier on, I applaud the effort and the thought. The results are not always successful in design terms, but at least Vatia is giving it a go, not playing it safe and trying things out. And I appreciate that. It's only by trying new things that we learn and progress. After all, staying in the traditional safe zone is fine, but you tend to tread water in that place. Nevertheless, even though I question elements of the design, the DG1 is still an eminently usable turntable. But it's not for the funky design and looks that you should buy this turntable. And I know it's difficult, but really, ignore what the DG1 looks like. Ignore the different features, the quirky features, the innovative features. Ignore all that. That's not why you're buying the DG1. Ultimately, you're buying it to listen to music. And the quality of the music coming from the DG1 is, in a word, lovely. The natural way that the DG1 handles music, how it treats music with a sense of respect, but also how music retains its organic and balanced nature. For these reasons, and many more, you should take a close look at the Vatia DG1. It's a gem, and I'm eager to hear more from this company. So the DG1 is a winner, in my eyes at least, and I urge you to take a close look, grab a demo, if at all possible. And that's all from me. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for staying with me until this point, And I would love to have your company in the next one. Until then, bye-bye for now. <laughs>